been very well received, uh, whether it's a small audience or a larger audience, various topics. Um, my name is Scott Mansky, by the way, and I'm a that's uh, today. So thank you again and welcome. And today we have Marianne Beacon joining us from Elderberry Herbal. And Marianne's going to talk about uh, negotiation and negotiating through some uh, maybe difficult conversations and a, a way to do that, a different model to bring to that. I think it's going to be fairly interactive. And so I'd like to welcome Marianne. Thanks, Marianne. Hi, everybody. Thank you for coming. Um, I'll just tell you briefly a couple things about myself and then we'll move into this model which is called Encounter Language. Um, my business is Elderberry Herbals. I've uh, started Elderberry Herbals about five years ago, but I've been training and practicing um, in healing arts for uh, almost 20 years now. So um, first and foremost, I'm a herbalist and I've uh, been studying Reiki for many, many years. Um, I also do bone therapy and um, have recently studied psychotherapy, which is where I'm drawing this from today, this encounter language. Um, I run a program called Community Shared Herbalism and take uh, Reiki and herbal students. So if there's anything that you are curious about and you want to talk to me about, you can um, please support me at the end and we can, we can do that. But for today, I want to introduce you to something called encounter language. Um, We've all had those situations that get a little iffy, you're not quite sure what's going on. Um, maybe you don't know how you're feeling or what's going on inside. Maybe you don't know what's going on with another person. And um, this model will help you get through those difficult situations, even if you are the only one using it. Okay, so it's really, hello, welcome, come on in. So um, this can be a really useful tool if you are in your workplace. It can be really useful in family settings, um, with a spouse, with friends. It doesn't really matter. It's not. It doesn't have to just be something that you use in, in um, professional settings. Um, and you can use the whole model if things are really difficult, the conversation is really tight, or you can even just kind of pluck out certain aspects of it, and we'll go through that. Um, uh, as we go. Um, basically, this, this model will kind of help you understand how information is moving through you. Okay, So um, I'll just briefly mention something uh, about the zones, the zones that we have. So you guys are all, for me, you guys are all out in the outer zone. So anything that's outside of your realm, um, your body, your, you know, this personal space, is the outer zone. Often that's where information is coming in. Um, I once heard it said, said that we have access to about 70,000 pieces of information every second. Our brains can't fully take in all of that. We filter most of it out and we can process maybe 5,000 pieces of information every second. So honestly that's pretty mind-boggling and most of that we do so unconsciously. Right? And there's a lot of things happening every minute, every second of the day that we have to process. Um, so these things happen in the outer zone. And usually when it's in the outer zone, um, what the awareness we're trying to develop in the outer zone, you're going to pick up through your five senses. Okay? So that's um, uh, sight, hearing, touch, taste, smell, basically. Um, so all of that is in the outer zone. So here I've got my little friend here, Fred. Um, this is Fred's outer zone. So John, Peter, and Bob are in Fred's outer zone. Um, so in terms of the flow of information, something happens in the outer zone and it moves through us. Like we we um, hear it, we see it, we feel it, or whatever. And the first place it goes to is the brain. Okay, um, that's called the middle zone, um, and this is the place where we interpret everything that we see, hear, touch, taste. It goes to the brain. It, it this is a uh, Fred's middle zone up here. 
Um, that's where we interpret everything. So what we're aiming to, to increase our awareness of is what we're interpreting, right? How we're interpreting. These are all thoughts. Now our thoughts are influenced by so many factors, some of which we're um, conscious of or able to be conscious of, and some of those thoughts are working through us unconsciously. Um, we've all had a, a many, many years, decades perhaps, of experiences, so we're moving through those um, experiences. We have beliefs. Some of our beliefs are conscious. Some of our beliefs are unconscious. All of these things inform us when we're creating thought about something. The third zone, so if something's happened in the outer zone, it's moved into the middle zone where it's being interpreted. Now based on how we interpret that thing we saw or heard, is going to affect the inner zone, which is here, the heart. So we're you know, we might see or hear something that um, is completely benign and we don't have a particular reaction to it. Or we might hear, hear something that um, we have a reaction to. And that that's an emotional reaction. We can feel it in a, a theoretical sense emotionally. I feel happy, I feel sad. But sometimes you actually feel it in your body. You know, sometimes you feel those emotions physically. Um, you get nervous, you shake. You know, there's a physical reaction to the emotions that you experience. Even if you feel feeling shut down, that's still a reaction. So the awareness that we're trying to become aware of is these feelings, emotions, and it can be kinesthetic. referring to a physical sensation. And based on all of these things, we've got this flow of information. It's moved from the outer zone to the middle zone and to the inner zone. Um, there might be something that we want or need to resolve how we're feeling about the situation based on our interpretation of something. So, the awareness that we try to develop in the fourth part is just what do we need in the situation. Okay. So I've got a little silly example. We're going to use Fred. Fred's hanging out with his buddies. Yes, we can. So Fred's hanging out with his buddies, they're having supper together, and John says, I hate broccoli. Okay? Random statement. Peter hears that and he says, meh, boring, let's move on. Bob hears that and he says, I hate broccoli too. I also hate Brussels sprouts and I hate Cabbage, and I hate peppers. Let's make an anti-vegetable club. Awesome. Right? Fred says, he hates broccoli. He must hate my cooking. Maybe John doesn't like me. And all of a sudden, Fred is um, upset. He's irritable. He's snapping at people, maybe, or he's become reclusive, and John, Peter, and Bob are going, hey man, what's going on? <laughs> like, have no idea what's happening here. So if Fred were to take a moment and step back um, and use this model, then what you, can, what you can do is discover what's at the root of the problem. Because if John says, I hate broccoli, and Fred says, you hate me, like that's a big disconnect, right? There's like, how did you get from one place to the next? And these kinds of situations happen all the time <laughs> with very real examples. You may have some thoughts, you know, you may be able to recall something like this that's 
little less silly than broccoli. Okay. So using this model, and this is a way you can actually break down the conversations. Sometimes it's good to slow things down, right? Because when you slow it down, you can, you can, you know, maybe all Fred has the awareness of is um, a feeling. Maybe he's just upset. But when you can um, kind of break it down into pieces, it can help to um, make the puzzle a little more clear. You know, it can put the puzzle together of what's actually going on here. So if Fred were to use this model, he would say, I've heard that you said you hate broccoli. So in this part of the communication, what you're doing is you're you're using you're making a statement about something that's happened in the outer zone. It's observable by many people. This is this is something that actually occurred, okay? Um, and you're using your five senses, and you're saying that as well. I heard you say you hate broccoli. So in the second part is where you talk about how does that affect you? What happens in this middle zone? And this is the place where often the communication breaks down. Um, somebody mishears somebody else. Somebody's imagining that somebody's thinking something. Um, there's a lot that goes up on up here that we interpret. And some of it's based on reality, and some of it is not. Some, you know, some of it's based on personal history or beliefs or so on. So let's say Fred says, I heard you say you hate broccoli. I imagine that you don't like my cooking. And I remember that my other friend didn't like my cooking. And when my other friend didn't like my cooking, my other friend didn't like me. So there's a, there's a personal history the person has that's informing this moment. It might not be true in this moment, but it's informing what's going on for that person. And then he would go on and he would say, and the way I feel about that is, I feel scared, or I feel upset, or I feel hurt. Um, there's a lot of feeling words that we have, and um, I'll talk about that a little more in a moment. But what he's going to say is, this is what it does to me. These thoughts, this is what it does to me. I feel upset. Yes? Why does he make feeling these cooking lessons? Why does it always have to be the fault of the other person? We can get into that. You know, here's Fred with his hurt feelings. Why doesn't, I mean, first of all, in that gender specific, it'd be unlikely to happen because generally you can just hear that the guy doesn't like broccoli. But if someone, if we extrapolate the example, and Fred, whoever Fred is, feels hurt, why doesn't he just feel that he should maybe take cooking lessons because his friends don't like his cooking? Every person has their feelings, and they they will have their feelings based on whether they should have that feeling or not. Right? There's a million one answers to this possibility. So maybe he says, you know, I want to know if you hate my cooking. Well, maybe John says, yeah, actually, I do hate your cooking. You know, and I would like, you know. I would really love it if you went about cooking lessons, and that does not mean I don't like you. Okay. So what we're after is that miscommunication piece of one thing equals another. Maybe that one thing doesn't equal another. Maybe Fred is a terrible cook, and he's turned his broccoli into mush. Right? That's altogether possible, but it does not mean that John doesn't like you. Okay? But in real life, what quite often happens is Fred is now angry at John because his feelings have been hurt. But in real life, why doesn't the Fred character just think, I'm a crap cook, I'm going to take lessons. Why does he have to get his feelings hurt and be angry at all these other people? Um, he doesn't have to. Maybe that's one of the issues he needs to work on. It's true. But this is a way of, of bringing it up, the process out into the open so that you can talk about it. Right? Mm -hmm. 
instead of it all just being hidden underneath the surface. Because often this piece here, this piece happens up here silently and nobody talks about it. And what we're wanting to do is, is bring that out to the open. Fred can take responsibility for those thoughts. John might take something else. He might say, why don't you go get some cooking lessons and then you suck. Okay? I'm not saying what the outcome needs to be or whether John is in the wrong. I'm making no statements as to who's right or wrong here. All I'm offering is an opportunity to bring the things that happen inside of us that we often keep silent about and we just behave from that place. It's bringing it out into the open and saying, okay, this is where I'm at. John has every equal opportunity to use this model and say, I hear you saying that you're upset with me. Um, I imagine you think um, that I'm in the wrong here. I, I imagine you think I intentionally hurt you. Okay? This makes me frustrated. I'm, I'm very frustrated because of this. We've had this conversation before, John. What I really want <laughs> is to go out for pizza next time. I don't, I, you know, I don't want to have this conversation anymore. Like, I'm not saying one person needs to be in the right and one person in the wrong. Okay? Does that help? No. If this was moved into the workplace, and uh, John says, this, there's a file on the table, this file is a mess, and Fred hears, you don't like me because you think I'm incompetent because this file is a mess. But John didn't really actually say that. How does this have a more productive kind of uh, resolution. These things happen all the time. These kinds of conversations that are clear happen all the time, right? So what I'm saying is if you break it down a little bit and bring those things out into the open, that people have the full responsibility to, or the, the opportunity to respond to these things in a way that's less, um, triggering, less likely to inspire a defensive response, and you could actually move through. Now there's a few tips that I'm going to mention regarding the way you use your words. Okay? Um, anytime you say, you did this, you've left the mess, and so on and so forth, um, that kind of language is quite um, assertive, possibly even aggressive. So um, what I would encourage through this language is using I language, right? It totally changes the scene when you start to say I instead of you, okay? So um, I noticed that your desk has got files all over it. Um, I imagine that you haven't got, you're not organized. Okay. Uh, what I feel is worried that you're not going to be on time with your project. What I need to know is, do you feel that you can be on time? Does that change how you feel about the communication rather than your desk is a mess, you don't know what you're doing? Yes? I just want to pick up on your first point. Basically, you had John asking, why doesn't Greg go take cooking lessons? That's it, right? Why doesn't Greg just do that? No. Well, you did say that. Why doesn't yeah. Greg just go No, I said, why doesn't Fred say to himself, uh, John okay. hates broccoli, he hates my broccoli. Okay, good. All right, so that's, why good, that's a good question. So what I was going to propose is that Fred hears John and says to himself, how can I process this? Which goes back into the emotional intelligence stuff that you're referring to. So that, that would be the right question, is I think, for Fred to say, how can I process this? What John's telling me? Rather than feeling guilty, feeling defensive, pushing back. So, so there's, there's some language stuff here for sure. The why question is definitely one of those confrontational questions. Why when not you your desk? So ultimately, this communication is about taking responsibility. 
You're taking responsibility for how you're interpreting things, and you're taking responsibility for your feelings. You're not saying, um, you make me feel this way. Okay? That's a big difference. I'm not saying, you make me feel this way. You're saying, I saw this, I interpreted it this way, and I feel this way. You know? Peter didn't feel that way. Bob didn't feel that way. He wanted to form a club, right? It's, we all have our own interpretation that happens up here. And this, this model, this is what we're doing. We're taking that responsibility for this piece right here. Maybe Fred has never considered taking cooking lessons. You know? These are all, like, it's a, it's a process. It's a movement. Like this is, it's an encounter rather than actually a negotiation. That's what I would like, like to suggest is or invite people to consider it more of an encounter. You know, this person's on your team, this person's your friend, your colleague, your, you know, your family member. Let's encounter each other and try and work through something that's difficult rather than, you know, um, negotiate or this isn't my opponent. Okay? Because so we can get into seeing that other person that we're talking to as our opponent. And we kind of shift that thinking a little bit and say, well, you know, let's work together to move through this. And, you know, maybe Fred's taking the opportunity to, to say this, and maybe John's going to have his opportunity, take his turn to say what he feels about, about it. Okay? So there are some really key things that will empower your language, though, when you're communicating with people like that, like this. Um, at all times, I'm going to put it here, but always bring your communication into the present tense. Okay? Um, something may have happened last week, uh, and you can really get into a tangle by, by saying, he said, she said, you said, I said. Right? It gets really messy. But if you say, you know, bring what happened last week into the present moment and say, I'm remembering that you said something. What it does is it empowers that moment and it empowers your communication by, by having it be in the present. Could be that your remembering is a little off. Could be that the other person's remembering is a little off. But it, whatever the case may be, this is what you're remembering right now. In this section, what I want to say is use use I statements. When you use an I statement, you're taking responsibility for what you're saying. You're not placing it on the other person. You're not saying that the other person said it, thought it, felt it, believed it, or anything. You're saying, this is my interpretation, and I'm taking responsibility by saying, um, I believe this. I imagine this. I imagine that you're thinking this. So I'm not saying you're thinking this. I'm saying I imagine you're thinking this. And that gives the person the ultimate ability to say, wait, uh, okay, I can, I can see how you might interpret that, but that's not actually what I was thinking or feeling. But as soon as you say, um, you believe this, or you think this, or you want this, then you're taking, you're, you're losing the power of your statement, and you're potentially triggering your, your friend um, into being like defensive. Whoa, wait a minute, you know, I never said that, I never thought that, you know, anyway. Because we don't, we don't ever really have the total knowing of what's going on in another person's head, but we have a lot of imaginations about what's going on in another person's head, and we can check it out. We have, we have the power to find out what's going on for another person. But the, the safest way to do that is to, to use an I statement. <laughs> so Fred says to John, I imagine you ate my cooking. Mm -hmm. And John says, no, no, it's not that. You're right. Exactly. You ate meat. You have all kinds of interpretations. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I mean, okay. it's also very frustrating when John says, I ate broccoli, and Fred says, I imagine you hate me. John looks at Fred and thinks, you're nuts. 
You know, it's like, where did that come from? That can cause friction just because Fred did voice that I imagine that you ate broccoli, you ate cookie, you ate my cookie, and you ate me. Yes. If that conversation actually took place, these two people would be having a quarrel. Exactly. Communication between two cognitively tech people requires that they both engage in the conversation, not just assume what the other person's thinking. Mm -hmm. So they need to speak to each other about what they heard and what they think, yeah. not just assume. So they need to have that conversation. So, you know, um, and they get some silly to say, you know, so the last person that told me that they hate broccoli really meant that they hated me. And therefore, that's sort of thinking. But as silly as it sounds, if that's your reality, then you need to always have to be a person so they know where you're coming from, so they don't think you're someone in that. And when you leave these, some of these steps out, then you have the potential for escalation. And that's, you're right, that's where the argument happens. And nobody knows where they, why they're arguing. But when you bring in these other things, you have the moment for where John could um, have a moment of compassion for this other person. You know, wow, Fred, what's going on? You think I hate you because I said I hate broccoli. You know? Um, and then it can get deeper. The relationship can get deeper there. Right? There's the, the, the door gets opened to conversation instead of closed. Okay, so all I'm suggesting is you, you bring all these, these different places out into the open, these different sections of, of what, where your awareness is. You know, um, we have the outer zone, something happened up there, we have the, the middle zone where we interpret it, and we have the inner zone, and how that affects, um, you know, what we feel is affected by what we're thinking about something. Okay, and if you can bring those, those pieces out into the, to speak them, then you can have real conversation. Now, I'm not saying you have to do this in every single scenario, like we would never get anywhere, right? <laughs> but, but when things are really tough, you have like co-workers who are really not getting along, you have spouses who, you know, they're prone to fighting. If you bring this in and each person is diligently trying to do this kind of conversation, um, you will see movement, you know? And, just make some agreements, we're not going to do name calling, like all those kinds of things can be choices that people make agreements on. Feeling, I was on to feelings. So um, I want to say something about feelings because you know like there's a there's dozens and dozens of words that we use to attribute to our feelings, right? And um, there's also some things that we can get caught up in. So um, there's lots of things that are feelings, and then there's things that are thoughts that we try and we're confused about, and we try and turn them into feelings. And one little trick to learn to recognize if you're doing that is if you say, I feel that, blah, 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 it's not a feeling anymore. It's a thought. It might be completely valid thought, but it's not a feeling. Okay, because um, usually it's it ends up being I feel that you blah blah blah. <laughs> Don't use that. Don't use the word that. This word here is a clue that what you're saying isn't a feeling anymore. It's a thought. And if you want to say that statement, use it over here, or maybe it's an idea that you want to implement. Use it over here. This is what you want. This is not a feeling. Feelings say, I feel happy, I feel sad, I feel angry, I feel frustrated. You don't say, I feel that. I, you know, I guess some people do say, I feel that I am frustrated, but it's, it's removing yourself from your own feelings. It's like taking a step away from your feelings and saying, okay, there's a feeling over there. I feel that I'm frustrated. You know. If you take that, again, that ownership over your feeling, it will empower you. It will empower your communication with the other person that you're with. Okay? And then this last one I want, this is not the time to become the taskmaster and give your friend a whole list of things to do. Okay? Um, this is the place where you're 
trying to create a place where you're finding resolution. So maybe what you really want is to check something out. You know, I heard this, I'm imagining this, I'm feeling this, I want to check that out with you. Do you really feel that way? And that gives the person the opportunity to say, yes, I feel that way, or no, I don't feel this way, but this is how I feel. Or maybe what you want to do is tell your friend, this has happened, and I feel like I want to withdraw from you. Or I really want to talk about this more. Or I really want to tell you something that I, this is how I feel. That could be all that you all that you really want is just to bring it out into the open. Okay. Um, it can really help you to to get clear, you know, about where you're going with this communication. <clears throat> Um, yeah, so again, it's like one of those things where you're, you're taking responsibility, um, what do I want, not what do I want you to want, or what, I, what do I want you to do. So again, it's like all of this is, is trying to attempt at um, putting the onus on ourselves, and taking responsibility for everything that's going on in this like middle inner zone, and what, what do we want to see from this. And then just know that if you're with, if you're in an active communication with somebody, you're going to get to hear what they want, and then you can kind of go back and forth, right? And say, well, how how do we come closer on this? Instead of like, how do we come apart? Um, what this does, I mean, I think this is often used in a personal setting um, with family members. I think it has application in a work setting as well. Um, you may have coworkers who are familiar with the model, or you may not. Um, you might encounter a, a client who is quite upset about something. You can still use this model without them knowing it. Um, because what what this model actually does is it, it helps the other person to know that you're actually acknowledging and hearing them. So instead of just having somebody say something and then you just react with your rebuttal, if you're slowing things down a little bit and you say, OK, I, I heard you say that, right? So right away, that person knows that you heard them say that. As, you know, some of the things that makes people most upset is if they're not feeling heard. Okay? As soon as somebody catches a glimpse that you are really listening to them, then you've got a door, again, it's another door opening moment where you can actually, um, it will slow things down, it will start to de-escalate uh, things and um, allow you to find out some of the other things that are going on underneath. You know, sometimes, you know, a person saying something, but what you don't know is what's driving that, what's underneath. So what this, what this allows is for you to, to bring that out into the open and find out what's really going on. You might actually really need that information. You know, so let's say um, you have a customer who's come to you and is really upset, and they've got, they're upset about a product they bought from you. Uh, it could be that the last three times they tried to return something, they had a horrible time with other, um, with other companies. And if you find out that piece of information, um, then you can assure them of what your policies are, right? But what if the underlying information you find out is that they've been trying to return this for three weeks and your staff people have not helped them? Well, you want to find that information out too, right? So. Um, Often when people are upset, they are just they're kind of ramped up. They've got a bit of adrenaline going on, and this communication can slow things down, help them to know that they're being heard, and that you can find out what's really going on underneath. And I feel that it brings some heart into your business, right? Um, it allows you to know that the, you know to share with that person that you are having a you know a feeling about this. Um, like, I imagine that 
you've had a terrible time trying to return things. I feel really um, upset about that, and I want to do what I can to help you have a good experience with my company. Right? You, you're connecting with that person on a heart level at that point. You know, and I we have this whole idea that we need to be professional and you know, we're working with colleagues and and honestly, like who do you think about when when you're um, when you're thinking about people you have good experiences with? It's people who can connect with you on that real level. Even if somebody's your superior at work, if they're if they're gonna elevate you to being in an equal place by connecting with you here. Those are the relationships that are really going to form and be strong and where you develop a lot of trust. Okay? So I think that this has a model might not be for every single situation. You may not have to go through all the steps, but just see what happens when you say something like, all you're using is the first two things. You know, oh, I heard you say this thing and this is what I imagine you mean. Well, even saying that can give a person an opportunity to say, actually, I meant something else. And then you're just getting more and more and more clear with your communication rather than allowing miscommunications to be forming as you go. So I do think that there's a possibility that this kind of language can make you a little bit more vulnerable. Okay, but I think it makes you vulnerable in a strong way. And it, you know, if if we're just not vulnerable ever, like there's a wall around us. You know, and one of the things you can really do to to strengthen your relationships in your workplace is to be really fully truly human, right? And just um, you know, have that kindness that comes from here, and you can bring that into your business, and totally it will strengthen your business to, to engage with your clients and your colleagues and whoever, you know, your suppliers on this level. And it, you know, like I said, it doesn't have to be every single, every single step, but what it's also, this, this um, model does is it teaches you about yourself and how you think. You know? I've become more acutely aware of how I'm thinking about things by just having this, aware this awareness of this model. And then I can start to recognize in myself, wow, every time this scenario happens, this is what I'm thinking. You know, Maybe this is being driven by something else. Maybe this is being driven by a past experience that I could you know, chill out on. <laughs> you know, just re change how I'm thinking about this. Um, Maybe there's a, a unconscious belief that I'm moving from that I want to uncover and choose to believe that or not to choose to believe that. So I think there's a lot of potential for one's own personal development, even if it's just done privately um, within yourself. Because when you start to think in this model, it starts to just give you more and more layers of awareness as you're, as you're speaking. Does anybody have any questions at this point? Yes? Just one or two comments. Um, you use the word choice. And I think that without awareness, we can't make a choice because we're stuck with our condition. Yeah. Which is very much describes my dog. <laughs> because all it has to go on is instinct. Right. We think it's making choices with human. It's all just genetic selection. Absolutely. We human beings are able to make broad choices. And I hear you saying that that's what level two is, middle section. That's where, it, that's where all this happens. Because our senses just do what they do. But it's when we then process it to gain awareness to make a choice. Right? It, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, even having this awareness, we might choose to not, you know, we might choose to uh, change our thinking right in the moment. You know, there's been lots of scenarios where I feel myself starting to react and I start to unpack it. So I'm having this feeling, what's going on? You know, and I start to think back, you know, uh, 
somebody said something and now I feel this way, so what happened here? And then I can choose to continue with that thought and that feeling, or I can say, that's silly. Exactly. When I start flooding, then I, that's when I have to catch that feeling. Yeah. And then apply awareness again and say, I need to leave the room. <laughs> or whatever, you know. Yeah. Or I need to cut this conversation off. Yeah, and depending on your relationship, maybe you go through this whole process with that other person, or maybe you just say, I just need a few minutes, yep. go, chill out, and then kind of come back to the scenario. But it's choice, it's the best Mm -hmm. what you said. Because you can see that's where choice happens. Yeah, it is. And that's where we can change the most, too, I think. You know, we can change our thoughts about something. Then, you know, like every time somebody cuts me off when I'm driving, they don't hate me. <laughs> They're not going to get me. <laughs> but if I have that thought, then that's going to lead to the road rage, right? But if I can say, you know, back off from that thought and say, okay, every person who cuts me off on the highway doesn't hate me, then I'm, I'm making my day a little better, you know. <laughs> I'm, I'm a little bit happier because I'm not getting upset about that person on the highway. So what do you know what your core values are, too? Because you can't make a choice if you don't have values. You know, if you don't know what they are, then you can't choose between one and one. Yeah, in my training in psychotherapy, they, um, one teacher in particular said that our, we, everything can distill down to about seven core values, our fears. What are they? Oh, I, I should have brought that with you, but basically they all have to do with survival and belonging in some form or another. I'm not good enough, um, I'll never be included. So value yourself. Value others, right? That's that sort of thing. So. Well, there's definitely ways out of, out of those those issues, um, but it is pretty simple. We we are creatures that need to be in community, and you know, see, even simply feeling like slighted a little bit can trigger all kinds of feelings if if it's a, a core belief, you know. And if you think about it, the first how many people rem really remember the first five years of their life? You have lots of memories from there? No. A lot happened in those first five years. A lot. And all of it is still in here and informing us. And we really don't, you know, aren't, aren't that conscious of that. So, yeah, I mean, it's just a, an opportunity to, to grow and become more aware of our own selves and what's motivating us, right? <laughs> Any other questions or comments? Um. I had one, this is a quick one I just picked up the other day. And it's basically this replace judgment with curiosity. Right. It's simple. Yeah. When you find yourself judging, then you that choice to be curious more. What do they think? Well, we don't. We also don't have to take on everybody's view, right? That's an interesting thing. You know, if you know that person's entitled to their opinion, and I don't have to take on that opinion. I don't have to agree with it. I don't have to disagree with it. I don't have to prove them wrong. I, it's like very freeing. They just don't judge it. Just accept it. And it's their problem. Their problem. I'm curious, right? Yeah. I mean, if you're intimately engage with that person over something important, then yeah, you have to work with that, right? you got a major deadline, or you're trying to buy a house together, or <laughs> there's lots of scenarios where, where what another person believes will significantly impact you. Um, and so this is where you use these, these kinds of tools. Um, so I had a little handout that I, I wanted to teach you guys. Basically, everything that I've kind of talked about up here is just outlined. So, if you have any questions from there, um, if you have any questions at a later time, you can always be in touch with me. Um, I 
I have put some contact information um, on the bottom of this page. Um, but I have a, you know, a website that you can write to me through and, and so on. And I, I live in Peterborough, so you know I have an active business here. So if you ever want to be in touch about anything, then feel free. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, Marianne. Thank you. Interesting enough, you guys the same way, but uh, everyone's got a fast paced life and kind of ironic and interesting both. I, I took a lot of slowing down, being in the moment, being self reflective, ownership from this model, and just even the ability to be here for 40 minutes and have the opportunity to reflect on that was self reflective. So, anyway, it was very, very interesting, and, and I, I did take a lot from this. Uh, Thank you for your participation and mobilizing some of yourselves. But certainly what I, I take most from this is it really is about not expecting this from somebody else first, doing it yourself first. And then, you know, and being in that moment and slowing things down. So anyway, at the risk of repeating you too much, thank you very much. I appreciate that. I uh, hope that everybody else took something from this and enjoyed your time. Thank you for joining us. Uh, sincerely, thanks again to Bell, our sponsor. And hopefully you'll, uh, you'll uh, take the advantage of, as, as a chamber member or not, uh, the advantage of coming into these in the future. So I wish you the best for the rest of your day, and thank you again for joining us. Thanks, Brandon.